from his assistant, which is quite long, so I tried to um, cut it down a little bit so that they would have more time to speak. But there's so many amazing things here that it's hard to talk about. But um, right now, Dave is serving as CEO and director of Intellisum Inc. And this is one of many of the software or um, hardware companies that he's founded and acted as CEO. Um, other companies that he has founded and acted as CEO include iOmega, which is a, a data storage equipment supplier, and Dave was the lead founder, president, and CEO, and iOmega is now valued at over a billion dollars. Um, now you'll have to help me on some of the pronunciations. <laughs> okay. Uh, Saracor, is that Saracor. Right? Mm -hmm. and that's a, a developer of CAD and CAM software, which I don't know much about, but sounds very <laughs> neat. Um, and Saracor was sold to Hewlett Packard. Uh, Sarah Star, is that right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and that develops and provides converged network services, um, like voice, video, and data networking services. And then VZ Corporation, which is an object-oriented software development company. And I'm sure Dave will refer to several of these um, while he's speaking to all of you. Um, a few other highlights during Dave's distinguished career, if, that, if all those companies were not enough. Um, he spent 15 years in engineering and management at IBM. He was a managing partner of the DLB Group. He acted as chairman and CEO of Clyde Digital Systems, which is a software security development company. And Dave led this company as it went in public. Uh, he was honored as Entrepreneur of the Year by Mountain West Venture Group in 1988 and also by Utah Information Technologies Association in 2002. And then the best of all, Dave was honored at Utah State as a distinguished alumnus in electrical engineering where he graduated with his bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering, correct? That's right. So join with me in welcoming Dave Davis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to come and visit with you a little bit and talk to you about uh, my background and experience. Uh, I think if we make this more informal, you might enjoy it more. So while I'll be talking, if you feel like you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand and we'll go to the questions as well, all right? And uh, I plan to sp uh, only take a part of the time, so there will be time for questions after we get through, but, uh, uh, but feel free to ask any point in time, all right? This is a great group and I appreciate the weather that you've arranged for me to come up here. <laughs> And uh, anyway, it reminds me of, uh, I guess, when we were here. I, I, uh, uh, I have great fond memories of going to Utah State University. Uh, as I tried to introduce things, I thought it might be worthwhile, since probably my most famous uh, company that I've had an opportunity to be associated with was the iOmega Company. And I don't know how many of you know the iOmega company. Do you, any, any of you ever use the zip drives or the drives that iOmega had? Uh, there, uh, it was a, it was a very successful company. And one of the successes that uh, one of the reasons why iOmega was so successful for you guys who want to be entrepreneurs is that iOmega was at the beginning of a brand new industry personal computer storage. iOmega was really the first company that ever had removable media that was significant size to say, hey, this is personal, this is a removable and, uh, and computer, uh, uh, computer storage. And it was the first company who finally recognized that data belonged to the individual, not to the computer. Therefore, we had the removable media, and uh, and uh, the a lot of the guys, uh, as I tell people, and as we talk about it, say the reason it was a company was so successful is that we were on the leading edge of a brand new industry, a little less competition, a big opportunity because it was just growing, and and the guys like to say, and that's why we were successful that we saw that. Well, frankly, that's a bunch of baloney. We couldn't have that kind of insight. We didn't. We were kind of lucky, all right. 
and, uh, and just happened to get positioned in that place and, and was able to go forward and be quite successful. The company I'm currently in, however, I think after having had that experience, we're currently, we have positioned another company now at the leading edge of a new industry, which uh, I'll talk a little bit about, which is, uh, which is 3D media or 3D communications. Uh, I talk about the fact that uh, in the future and very near future, email will not be just email text kind of stuff. It's going to be email with 3D models where you can communicate with, uh, with the models that uh, are associated with. I think the technology is moving that way uh, very, very quickly. Uh, let me tell you just also a little bit about, uh, since uh, a lot of you are entrepreneurs, I understand, well, let me describe a little bit of the entrepreneurial background and experience and the things that I've seen happen in the industry for the short period of time that I've been here, even though uh, it sounded like I'm really old with all of the things that I've done, I'm really fairly young. and. Uh, so uh, don't believe all that stuff. But anyway, uh, when I started I Omega Company in 1980, and we started it, uh, I was, at the time I was working for the IBM company in Tucson, Arizona, and finally when I went to uh, uh, start the, uh, the company, uh, it was interesting that once the company was funded, and, and once we got out and got involved in raising more money, once we had actually started the company, uh, I have to tell you that every place I went uh, and asked for money, and I went all over the United States and in Europe, trying to raise money and in the United States, not so much in Europe, all of them used to say to me now, is this an honest Mormon deal in Utah? That was the environment that existed in trying to raise money in, for a company in Utah back in the early and in 1980 because of the reputation that had been established here. And then today, as uh, I've been raising money for this new company in Telesum, uh, we get totally different reaction, okay? Today, uh, Utah is well accepted as a, as, a, as a place where there are great technology opportunities and, uh, and a lot of the funds are a lot of uh, VC funds now are starting to look at uh, Utah as a source of these funds in order to build major opportunities. So it makes, it makes the world a whole lot uh, different than it was back then. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a, 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 a description of what we do in a telesum is I, I, I say what we've done is we've invented a 3D camera. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that when we go out and take a picture or multiple pictures of an area and put them all together, what you end up with is a 3D model that what we call is, uh, has been built with intelligent pixels, okay? And what that means is when you look at your computer screen and you see a picture of what we've captured, it looks like it's a digital photograph because it has all the visual qualities that you have in a digital photograph, but in reality, it's three-dimensional, so you can navigate into it, and you can measure around, look around, and do all kinds of things that you want to do. And so what we mean when we say intelligent pixels is what we're talking about is any place you touch on the screen, any pixel that you touch, we say that, that pixel is intelligent. It says, I, you can see I know my color, I know my t texture, it's real world, it's real uh, stuff that you see. Not only that, I can tell you where I am in a 3D world on the XYZ coordinate of anywhere in that scene. I can tell you exactly where I am to every other point within submillimeter accuracy. And not only that, I can tell you exactly where I am in the world, lat long and elevation within subcentimeter accuracy. That's what we call intelligent pixels, okay? And, uh, and when we put all of these things together, you have what we call an intelligent model. And that's what I'm talking about, is in the future, when you start communicating, it won't all be done with just uh, uh, email that's uh, text. You're going to start being able to ship these models around and communicate with these models. And, uh, and so the communications are going to be enhanced significantly. Uh, the company we're currently talking about, as I said, uh, it's, it's a different world now. 
and raising money than it was back in the 1980s. We have venture capital uh, 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 companies in uh, in Utah now that we never had then. V Spring, uh, you know, University Venture Fund or two that are invested in our company. So it's much easier to get these people invested in. Certainly, as you go outside the uh, the community, as I said, there's the recognition that Utah is a source of these kind of funds. So or or business opportunities. So so it's entirely different than it was before. Now, uh, what I wanted to do was just take a few minutes and talk about some of the lessons uh, that I've learned uh, over the past few years as I've been working in this area. And one of them is, is uh, kind of the respect for other people. Uh, there's, there's, you know, there's self-confidence and then there's arrogance. Uh, and, and, and I guess if you're like me when I graduated from Utah State with my master's degree in electrical engineering and went to work for the IBM company, there was a certain level of arrogance that I had, okay? I thought I was pretty darn good. I was pretty smart. I had a master's degree in electrical engineering and, uh, and, I, and I took that attitude within the IBM company. Uh, and and they were patient with me, and uh, and it began you know and and it helped. But there was one day, and I was working for a man by the name of Dick Cunahan. Dick Cunahan was a Quaker from Pennsylvania, and as I was working with Dick, and he was a funny little dude. He really was a funny guy. Okay, but as I looked at him and some of the things he said, I thought, you know. He may be a funny little dude, but he's got some good ideas. And I said, I think I can learn something from this guy. And then something clicked in my mind that, uh, that really affected my life. And I thought of the, of the saying of Will Rogers, who was the comedian, who said, I never met a man I didn't like. And as I thought of that, I decided I would accept a new motto or slogan in my life, which was, I will never meet a person that I don't learn something from. And from that point in time, my whole career changed, okay? Instead of the arrogance, I decided that wherever I run into anybody, I would try to learn from them because they had something that uh, I didn't have and, uh, and I thought that was important. And so I began to value differences in people and differences in situations. And as a result of that, uh, things happen. For example, uh, another uh, example of that is, as I told you, when I started the I Omega company, uh, we went and the first people we found the money from, uh, a guy by the name of D Dave Dunn, who was a very famous uh, uh, venture capitalist. And uh, when I approached him and we finally sold him on the idea, he liked our idea and said, let's, let's go ahead and start the company. And when he did that, he says, and here's the money. I've committed to give you the money to start this, uh, this company. And he says, and you can start this company anywhere you want to in the world but Utah. Okay? We were in Arizona at the time and uh, working for the IBM company. And uh, he says, so there's the money and now you can get started. Well, two of the guys that I had recruited to help me found the company really were adamant. They really wanted to come to Utah. And so uh, we had some major discussions with those people about that, uh, Dunn and his partners. And finally Dunn said to me, he said, okay, look, if you can, pr if you can prove, and I said, well, first I should explain to you. I said to him, well, why not Utah? And he says, well, he says, you're a Mormon and uh, Dave Norton's a Mormon and Rod Linton's a Mormon and everybody in Utah are Mormons. And he says, and that's just too much of one thing for me. See, so Dunn didn't care whether it was Mormons, if it had been Catholics or if it had been whatever it was, Jews or whatever, he would have had the same attitude. It wasn't that it was Mormons, it was just too much of one thing. He felt diversity was important. You needed to have the variety within a company in order for it to be successful. So he says, hey, if you can, be, if you can, teach, uh, if you can convince us that, uh, that it's possible to go to Utah and recruit non-Mormons into the state and they're happy once they get there and you'll commit to us that that's what you'll do, he says, we'll let you go to Utah. And he says, great. 
Well, so his partner and I uh, started to make arrangements to come to Utah and interview companies to find out whether or not uh, it was possible to do that. And of course, you didn't want to say raise, uh, recruit Mormons. We just tried to say educated somewhere not in the Wasatch Front. Uh, was uh, the way we were positioning it, okay? And so uh, uh, Mike, who was the partner there, called up this company in Utah, and he said, uh, you know, what's your experience in doing this? And the company says, oh, it's great, it's no problem, everything's fine, and they're happy once they're here. And Mike says, well, look, he says, can I talk to one of your non-Mormon employees and find out, you know, what the experience is? And he says, sure. He says he sat down the phone, he came back in about five minutes and said, I can't find one. <laughs> so that's how we got started through this process. We finally came, Mike and I came, and we interviewed companies all along the Wasatch Front and uh, found out that it truly was possible to do that. Uh, they committed to give us the money. We came here and we literally recruited um, out of the United States the majority or at least more than half of our uh, executive team at I Omega were not educated in the Wasatch Front. And they came and were quite happy and satisfied here. And so that was, uh, that was one of the things that, uh, you know, all those things have kind of affected me as I have gone through my, my career uh, of that. And then just recently in this new company that I'm working on now, uh, one of the board of directors suggested that I should le read this, this uh, book here, The Wisdom of the Crowds. I don't know if any of you have read this book or not. But basically what this book talks about is the fact that crowds can bring a better solution to problems than experts. And through the work that they've done, they've demonstrated where if you'll bring a group of people together and you talk uh, and you get from them their input and their thoughts and try to resolve a problem uh, that you'll end up with a better solution than if you go out and hire an expert to come in and, do, uh, and give you those thoughts and those ideas. And it was interesting that once he showed this to me and I read this book and then I got through the process of looking at the culture that we have within my company that we're talking about now, uh, I found that uh, this was the culture that we had and the management style we had. In fact, I call it uh, walks the talk. Walks the talk you've heard, but my walks is wisdom of crowds, synergistic solutions. Okay, that's how I spell walks, is wisdom of crowds, synergistic solutions. It's the acronym for that. And what I've found is that what you do is you go out and begin to bring in ideas from anybody and everybody you can, and hopefully the more diversified their backgrounds and experience, the more ideas you get in. And those ideas will normally fall into three categories. One is their ideas that you've already considered, their bad ideas, or their great ideas. And the whole idea that you're trying to do as you go out and bring these ideas in or get ideas that generate a difference. Because as soon as you end up with a difference, then you've got to act upon that difference. And if you resolve that difference, you, you've taken a step towards getting towards a synergistic solution. That differences can be, exist between personalities. It can be, exist between uh, performance and goals. It can exist between, uh, uh, between uh, uh, different divisions who have different responsibilities in your company. But that's the whole concept and idea is to work through generating those differences and then working through them, yes. Do you think it does primarily to do with industries that develop new things like the industry or is that uh, overall? I think that's uh, generally overall. I, I think any business that you get into where you want to be a, a competitive, and if you've got a competitive environment, you're always going to be looking for ways to be more competitive, and, and you've got to bring in different ideas no matter what it is in order for that, to, for that to happen. So I think it's a principle that exists generically throughout all industry of any type. Okay? Good. So, so that, was, that was kind of, I thought that was interesting as I look back over my career, how it started at early in IBM, where I began to decide I would learn from others, and now that's expanded into the culture that we have in this company, where we're bringing in all the ideas we can from different sources. Uh, 
The other thing that, uh, that has been rather interesting is uh, when I started the I Omega company, uh, I took some classes from uh, Stephen Covey. I don't know if you're familiar with Stephen Covey. And, and he was teaching a lot of stuff. And one of the books he asked us to read was a book uh, by Peter Drucker, who was one of the very famous uh, uh, consultants in, in the industry. And I read in the book, Effective Executive was the name of the book. And in that book, um, I think it's on a page about 73 of that book, he talks about the fact that he says, if you try to staff an organization with people who have no weaknesses, in other words, you only look for their strengths and you find people who only have strengths and no weaknesses. Do you know what he said? He says, the very best you can ever hope for is mediocrity. Okay? Because, because people who have no weaknesses typically don't have great strengths. He says, so you have to look for people who have great strengths. And once you find people who have great strengths, you identify their weaknesses and then you manage around their weaknesses. The example that he uses in that book is the Civil War. He says the South continued to win battles in the Civil War and Lincoln continued to try to staff the senior person in the North with someone who had no weaknesses. Finally, he selected Grant as the head of the Northern forces against the will of his cabinet who says Grant is an alcoholic. He has these weaknesses. You can't put him in as the head of the military. And Lincoln's response was yes, but he keeps winning. And so he put him in and as a result of that, uh, the, the war began to turn around. And so that is a point that I think is really valid. At I Omega, we had a VP of engineering who didn't like conflict. It would be hard for him to pressure people to make a schedule. And, uh, and that was creating a problem. And so finally I went to him and said, we've got this guy in engineering who's a real, real jerk, okay? He wants, and he pressures everybody and puts all this uh, pressure on people, and I'm going to make him your assistant, and his job is to manage your schedules. And uh, the VP says, but he'll upset everybody. And I says, yeah, I know. And that's your job, is to go around and smooth that over and keep them happy. As a result of the combination of those two people working together, at the end of three years in I Omega, when we probably developed one of the most complicated products that's been done in a small company like that, we were three months behind schedule, okay, after three years. And the only reason we were three months behind schedule is AMI refused to build our VLSI chip because they said there's going to be a change in it and we're not going to start it until you give us the first change. Well. We didn't give them the first change because there wasn't one. It was right the first time. Had they started it when we first gave them to them, we would have never been behind schedule, which was pretty amazing when you think of uh, the success was there. And so I, I think that's a, that's a uh, thing that you really have to look at is, and, and I think is a, invaluable in a management tool, is being able to manage with people, to identify people's strengths and then work around their weaknesses. And one of the other things to do is find your own strengths and take, uh, take advantage of your own strengths and manage around your own weaknesses because that's a thing that will make a lot of difference uh, there. So, that's, uh, that's some, of the, some of the lessons that uh, I've learned. Uh, some of the people once asked me the question is, why, what are the things that's made you successful? I think it's some of the things that we've talked about here. And one of the other things that I think has made me more successful than other people, and that is uh, the fact that, uh, that I, you know, I, I look out at this crowd here. I guess the best way to explain it is I look out at this crowd here, and, and I've had a, a lot of dealings with a lot of young people like yourselves, and I'm convinced that 80, 90% of you are smarter than I am. I'm totally convinced of that. Your IQ is, is, is better than mine, higher than mine, it just is. But I'm 68 years old, okay? And I would guess that I work harder than 90% of you. What do you think of that, huh? <laughs> My day starts at four o'clock in the morning and doesn't end till 10, 10.30, 11 o'clock at night. That's just the way I am, I'm a workaholic, okay? 
and I have been able to overcome other people who are a lot smarter than me because I just have learned to work a lot harder than most people have. And so I think that's one of the things that we have to learn in this life too, is uh, when we need to work, we need to really work hard and we need to commit ourselves to the things that, uh, that uh, really, really are going to make a difference. Uh, some of the other things that just come to my mind is uh, when I first came to Utah State, I, was, uh, I grew up in central Utah, okay, on a farm. And uh, I remember uh, when I was probably in the eighth grade, my math teacher, or not my math teacher, my shop teacher came up and touched me on the shoulder and he says, Dave, you're really good at math. You ought to be an engineer. And I thought, okay, I'll be an engineer. I had no idea what engineers did and then and, and probably didn't know till even after, almost after college before I had any idea in mind. Uh, I remember sitting in my first engineering introduction class and this uh, professor held up this piece of wire with this blob on it and he says, what's that? And I looked at that and I thought, I have no idea. And some half the class raised their hand and says, it's a resistor. And I says, oh, okay. And he held up another one. What's that? And it's a capacitor. And I thought, oh my gosh. <laughs> what are these things, right? The only wire I had ever had anything to do with was barbed wire, you know. <laughs> Nothing to do with these kind of things. And here I was sitting in this engineering class trying to figure all this out. And so, uh, you know, I guess it doesn't matter. My point is, I don't know if it matters what your background is. If you're committed to what you're doing, I committed when I was in the eighth grade to be an engineer, and that's what I committed to do and, and work through to get to that point. And then the other point that I would make is that when I was in engineering and when I graduated from school, all of my education in design was done with what? Vacuum tubes, okay? And the last vacuum tube I saw was here at Utah State. As soon as I got out, uh, out to work, I was working with transistors and VLSI and all those kind of things. And so, I don't know if it matters a lot what your education is as long as you use it to learn, to discipline, to think, and to be open and flexible uh, into the opportunities that are going to be there uh, before you. So, those are, those are some of the questions that are some of the things that I've learned. Uh, do you want to kind of open it up for any questions you have at this point in time? Yes. How did you transition then from being an engineer to being a CEO? Well, I, I worked for the IBM company for 15 years in, uh, in engineering and engineering management. And then when I finally uh, decided that I would start the iOmega company, uh, I just went out and put together a business plan and uh, my wife is watching me put together this business plan and she says, what in the world are you doing? And I says, I'm putting together a business plan to start a company based on this technology that we had been working on at IBM. And maybe I'll give you a little background on that. IBM had uh, uh, developed a removable media technology a drive in which we were working on and it was supposed to attach to a computer being done in North Carolina. The computer failed and so they had no place to attach the drive and so they decided they would cancel the project. And I went to them and said, let's not cancel it, let's take it out and sell it to other people who have computers. And they said, no, that's not our business, so they refused to do that. And so at that point in time, I said, well, let's see if we can start another company then outside. And so I made that decision to try and put that together and, uh, and was fortunate enough to be introduced to the right people who had the money and was interested and says, okay, yeah, we will fund your company. And so we get started. So, you know, I... I, I I learned that uh, OJT, I guess, on the job. I, I was an engineer and was thrown into the role of being the president and CEO of a company and, uh, and really just had to learn that. And fortunately, uh, the investors that we had were patient, understood my, uh, my background and the, the lack that I had and helped encourage me to, to learn some of that. It would have been great had I had the technical degree and an MBA in finance or something. That would have been a perfect uh, situation. That's what my son has, by the way. And that seems to be a perfect combination to do uh, technology startup companies, okay? Yes. 
Are you predicting or projecting this new company to be as well off as Omega? I think it's going to be bigger than Omega. Yeah, it's a, it's a really is a huge opportunity. We're uh, when you when you stop and look at the fact that 3D communications uh, right now we're working in architectural engineering and construction uh, is the is the area of focus that we have right now. And, and that, by the way, I'll just mention to you entrepreneurs, uh, this technology is applicable into anybody doing 3D modeling or design. So it could be in architectural engineering and construction, it could be in games, it could be in GIS, it could be in medical. All of those things would be applicable. And one of the things you find as an entrepreneur when you find you have these great ideas, you'll find that most of those ideas, if they're as good as you think, are applicable in many different places. And what you need to learn how to do is focus. You need to find the area where you're going to choose to make this thing successful. In our particular case, it was architectural engineering construction because architectural engineering construction had a higher uh, pain from a need for this kind of technology at this point in time. Plus, in this particular case, it was also, uh, it, uh, it has also had the highest requirements as far as accuracy and as far as uh, visual quality is concerned. So once we have been successful in the AEC market, it's going to be much easier for us to begin to open up the other markets. But we still have really maintained a very tight focus on AEC, even though other people are saying, why don't you go to games? You know, games are exciting. Everybody has games. There's a lot of sizzle in games, right? You ought to, use, you ought to do games. But games are selling about as many as they have, can right now. They don't need something, but they are going to go to real world uh, visual at some point in time, but it's not going to be right now where AEC is. So that's uh, how, how we do that. Yes? What's the depth of your 3D interface picture you take? Like what point does it end as far as 3D? Yeah, that, that's the, based upon the, the scanner that we use. And, and we buy our scanners, one from, uh, from Regal in Austria. So you see what happens on this all, maybe I should explain it a little bit. What we have done as far as the technology is you have a LiDAR scanner. LiDAR scanner is about that big, okay? And what LiDAR is, is like radar, only it's a light beam. And what you do is you send out this light beam from this scanner. It touches this point, bounces back. You know the speed of light, and you can then calculate the exact location of that point, the XYZ, right? Well, you can imagine if you put enough of those points on this object from all around, you begin to see all of these points begin to form this geometry, okay? And every one of these little points that you've touched this with knows its location relative to the other points there. So you've created the geometry with the LIDAR, okay? Now what we have, and this is a patent we have from Utah State, by the way. Utah State Dr. Uh, uh, Pack over in the engineering area invented this, and we have an exclusive license. Every time we send out that pulse and it touches that point, we take a digital photograph of that point. We mount a digital camera on top of the LIDAR, okay? We have built the software that will synchronize that camera to the LiDAR pulse so that every time the pulse goes out, we snap a picture. And so now, when it hits here, we not only know the location, we now know the color and the texture of that particular point because we've taken that digital photograph of it, okay? And so that's how we then generate something that looks exactly like that. Virtually it looks like this bottle once we get through modeling it. Now the question you have is how, what is the distance? Well there's two different kinds of LIDAR. There's a LIDAR that is uh, what they call time base, uh, time of flight, and, and you can get up to 3,000 meters on that, those. Uh, and, and then there's the phase based uh, LIDAR and that's more like 80 to 100 meters. So it depends on the LIDAR that you're dealing with this to give you the range that you can, you can work with, okay? Any other questions? Yes? So to visualize your, your image, you have a special projector 
or type of monitor to be able to... No, no, it runs off from your laptop. You can bring it up on your laptop and, uh, and you can see the image there and you don't see it in the, you know, if you had a 3D screen you would see it more 3D but it literally is a 3D image so you can go in and manipulate and maneuver it, turn it around and uh, navigate through it, you know. Yes? What's the competition like? Yeah, that's, uh, that's an excellent question. The competition is uh, right now in the AEC market where we're dealing with, right? And so you go out and you want to do a, 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 a project, you're competing with people who are doing a legacy kind of survey. You know, where you go out and hold the rod up and shoot, because uh, that's one of the things that, uh, th that is being used. Um, let me back up a little bit. I don't know if any of you saw here about three months ago uh, the news clip in, uh, of the bridge, the accelerated bridge construction that UDOT was doing on uh, I-215 and 45th South. And uh, what the, they were trying to see how fast they could build a bridge with a minimum amount of interruption of traffic. And so we got involved, we went out and scanned the old bridge. And from the scans that we had done of the old bridge, they were able to then build a CAD model, computer-aided design model of the new bridge. And then we took that and put it into our modeling environment. And because we had scanned the area around the bridge, we had exact dimensions and could see what was going on so that we could then take that 3D model and move it down the road to see if there was any conflict that needed to be taken care of before they actually moved the real bridge. So with that information that we did, they actually designed the bridge off the side of the road, the new bridge, once they had the new bridge completely designed in one weekend, and because they had modeled it and they were convinced of what they did, in one weekend they went in, removed the old bridge off from the road, and put the new bridge back on. They had two days of interruption on I-215. They had nine days of interruption on the overpass, and uh, that would be typically nine months. And so one of the applications that we use is, you know, they could have gone out and surveyed that information, but they wouldn't have gotten all the data that we had. And, and so one of our competitions is to have people go out and do survey kind of work, legacy kind of survey kind of work. The other competition we have are for people who go out and use LIDAR to get the point cloud kind of picture of what this looks like, but they don't get the color. They don't get the visual quality that we have. And so those are the two uh, com uh, competitions that we see in the industry today. Okay? So one of the things that you look for in this industry, or in, when you're doing an entrepreneurial kind of study, is you also take a look at, uh, at the market and what the opportunities are in the market. In this particular case, the AEC market, it's a $219 billion market opportunity for this kind of work and this kind of technology. And they're looking to try to move to new technology like we're talking about here, all right? Uh, 3D models, and the only technology they have is LiDAR today without the visual quality that we're talking about. And even with just that technology, this particular market is growing at 50% per year, and last year was $400 million. So you can see the opportunity. That means that of the $219 billion opportunity, only $400 million has taken advantage of what we have and that shows you you're at the beginning of a new uh, a new industry and that's where we think it's going to really open up and go forward okay anything else all right appreciate that and let me just I'm going to give you just two more stories to end with then and then uh, we'll we'll end this all right one of the things, uh, my son is, uh, his background, by the way, is, uh, is uh, computer science, bachelor's in computer science, and a master's in, or an MBA. 
And so uh, he worked for the IV, I, Intel company for a number of years, and now he has his own company that he's started uh, and is doing quite well there. So a couple of points that I think is worthwhile. One of the things that, uh, that he talks about, he's saying is, one of the reasons that uh, people are successful entrepreneurs is that one, they can see the future, and not only can they see the future, but they have the persistence and the dedication to make the future happen. And I think both of those are extremely important if you're going to be an entrepreneur. You've got to be able to kind of envision where the opportunity is, but then you have to also be willing to put the effort in to make it really happen. Entrepreneur work is extremely difficult. And you have to be almost a sick person in order to get into entrepreneurial work and put the energy and the effort and, and you have to be married to the right person as well. Someone who's very patient and willing to let you go through all of that kind of stuff. So you need to do that. The other thing is, and, uh, and this is a lesson I learned when I was in the ninth grade and, uh, and I didn't apply it very well in my life. But uh, when we come up with this idea that we're talking about here, it's a great idea, it really is. It's, it's, we've been all over the world. We've been to the leading companies throughout the world and they say, hey, you've got a technology that no one else has. We've been to Google and we've been to Microsoft and both of them want to work with us because they say, you are the only people in the world that are capturing real world, visually, dimension, visually dimensionally accurate and visually correct data. No one else in the world has the technology you have. This is a great idea, right? And when we got this program going and got it started, I went around and groveled in front of these MBA students who are now VCs, okay, to tell them what a great idea we have. And it took me two years groveling in front of you young guys in order to get the money, okay? And my son, he comes along and what does he do? He goes to the VCs and he says, what great ideas do you have? The best idea you possibly have that you would like me to run for you and manage. And they says, oh, this is the idea we want you to do. They throw money at this kid, okay? He gets all the money he wants and I still have to grovel and even though I've got a better idea, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the thing that you the learn, the message you have to learn there is the following. And that is, when I was in the ninth grade, I was, my English teacher was trying to teach me how to improve my writing skills, right? And so he gave me this little exercise and I would go through it and then Mr. Olroyd came down and did his thing and he says, now what do you think? And I says, well, I think mine's prettier than yours. And he says, well, he says, a mother always thinks her baby is prettier than anybody else's. VCs think their ideas are better than anybody else's even though they're not, right? So you might take that and think about that and say, is there one way if I wanted to start a business uh, you, know, you might have a great idea, but you might also find out what are the ideas VCs really want to invest in because that's what they're going to invest in, not your great idea. And that's the experience that I've had so far in that. Okay? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and uh, look forward. I guess we're going to have a reception or something and, and we can have some discussion up there. Thank you very much.